Hi, this is a lecture on confocal microscopy. The idea is it'll give you a sense of some of the theory behind this kind of microscopy, what its advantages are, and what its limitations are. So why would you use a confocal? Um, why is this worth um, a lecture? And so whenever I think about why to do something, I always think about what problem does that new technique solve? So what problem does a confocal solve? So let's, let's use as a reference wide field fluorescence microscopy, describe how that very common form of fluorescence microscopy forms an image, and then compare and contrast to confocal microscopy. So in wide field fluorescence microscopy, you typically have a sample. In that sample, you have fluorophores. Those fluorophores uh, are labeling things that you are interested in, and they're scattered throughout that sample. You have a lamp that sends light into a set of lenses and filters, and that light gets focused onto the sample uh, quite broadly, as is shown here. When it does that, those fluorophores uh, are excited by that light, and they emit longer wavelength light, which has less energy. Uh, and those photons are captured by lenses and uh, the whole apparatus of the microscope, and they're focused back onto what's called a sensitive area detector, which is typically a chip on a camera that's very sensitive to light. And so, for example, for things, uh, for fluorophores in the focal plane, and then the light from those uh, fluorophores is focused back and forms a, uh, a very small spot on a sensitive area detector. So that um, the, the particular um, fluorophore that you see there is focused back onto the, the camera. Uh, this other fluorophore is focused onto this other position in the camera. But fluorophores that are not in the focal plane, so that they're not where um, the objective has its maximum sharpness, um, like this one, they are also focused onto the camera, but their images are blurred. So instead of being a spot, they're more like um, a bigger spot or a set of rings. Um, so these out-of-focus objects are blurred. Um, another characteristic of wide view fluorescence microscopy is that this all happens at once. So I, I drew these little sort of ray diagrams of what things focus when, but this all happens at once. You illuminate everything at once, you collect all the light, you project it back onto a sensitive camera, and so you detect all these points in parallel. So the main problem that a confocal solves is this one, that out-of-focus objects are blurred in a wide-field fluorescence microscope. And so this blurriness reduces the contrast of any images because you have a superposition of things that are sharp and things that are blurred, so you have a mix of things that are in and out of focus. And this is what a confocal tries to address. And in fact, you can see that this is um, what a confocal was designed to do in the original patent uh, for a confocal that's dated on uh, from 1961 by Marvin Minsky. And so if you zoom in here, um, you can see that the, the another object of the invention is the provision of a microscopic optical system capable of rejecting all scattered light, except that emanating from the central focal point, i.e. the illuminated point of the specimen. Such high selectivity of light reduces blurring, increases effective resolution, and permits unusually clear examination of thick and scattered specimens. Um, so this is the whole point of the confocal, removing somehow that out-of-focus light. And so just to show you an example, this is a 15 micron kidney section image with the 63x 1.4 NA objective on two different kinds of microscopes. On the left, you see the results that comes from a wide field microscope. And on the right, you see the result that comes from a confocal microscope. And clearly the one on the right looks uh, much crisper, and that's because it doesn't have all this out-of-focus blurriness contributing to the image. So how does a confocal do this? So let's again come back to the schematic showing how a wide field fluorescence microscope works and contrast it to an equivalent schematic for a laser scanning confocal microscope. So again, you're going to have a sample. Uh, that sample is going to have fluorophores. Some of those fluorophores may be in the focal plane. So they may be um, where an objective can get the, the, the sort of the, the, the crispest image. Whereas other fluorophores are floating in other parts of the cells, the, the, of the cell that you're uh, not focusing on. And here I've just made those two categories of fluorophores different colors. Uh, but the, the colors are just for, for schematic purposes, so you can see what happens to the light from each. Uh, you should imagine the fluorophores as being uh, essentially identical. Okay, Again, that's just a schematic to show you where the light from each goes. The fluorophores are all identical. And so on a confocal, there are, there are several differences from, from a wide-field fluorescence microscope. 
so the first difference is um, we don't we no longer use a lamp to illuminate the sample. Instead, we use a laser. So a laser is a single wavelength source of light that's um, typically qu uh, quite powerful. Um, and we send that laser in through a bunch of lenses and scanners. So let's just consider that a, a kind of a black box for now. And instead of sort of focusing broadly, like the wide field fluorescence microscope uh, on the left, uh, the laser is focused into a really tight beam that converges onto the sample uh, in the focal plane and then diverges afterwards. So it's sort of focused down into a really small spot with these cones of light above and below as the light converges and diverges from that spot. Now, um, in this particular example, you can see that this sort of um, double cone of illumination is hitting two fluorophores, one that is in the focal plane and one that is out of the focal plane. So now let's uh, examine what happens to that light as it goes back through the lenses, scanners, and um, to the detector, which is behind something called a pinhole. Um, so if we look first at the light that is in the focal plane, so at the fluorophore that is in the focal plane, that is aligned in a way such that it goes through this pinhole, which is literally just a small hole in a diaphragm, and is fully detected by what's called uh, a spot detector. So this is a detector that has no spatial information. All it can do is sense amount of light. Um, and it is typically less sensitive than the, the area detectors on typical cameras. So the quantum efficiency is usually lower, meaning if it, a photon hits it, the probability that, that will turn into a measurable signal is lower. In any case, as I was saying, the light from the in-focus fluorophore uh, manages to get through the pinhole um, and to the detector. However, the light that comes from a fluorophore that is outside of the focal plane is aligned in a way such that most of it actually hits the edges of the pinhole and does not make it through to the detector. So the light from out of focus objects is removed by this pinhole such that it cannot reach, um, or most of it rather, cannot reach the spot detector. Um, another characteristic of this is that the detection is not in parallel. We were just, if you look back here, we were just illuminating a very small um, region of the sample. And so to detect light from um, an entire plane, we do it in series. Uh, and we do that by moving the light around, which is also called scanning. So we would start here, we'd go back there, we'd go there, and so on and so forth. And in fact, the laser scanning is not one dimensional, as you see here, where I'm just sort of scanning along the line, rather it's two dimensional. And so this is a typical pattern, uh, a typical what's called raster pattern of a laser that moves around a sample in a single XY plane. Um, so I'm going to show you a small video um, that will illustrate how this works. Um, and you can see here that uh, in a typical arrangement in sky, inside the, the, the confocal apparatus, there are two mirrors that move, one very quickly, one quickly but more slowly than this one. And the laser bounces off both. And uh, this is arranged in a very clever way such that the movements of the mirror make the laser uh, raster through the sample. And so that is how you get something like this. OK? All right, so this is the basic schematic of how a laser scanning confocal microscope works. Um, as I said, it gives you um, rejection of out of focus light. And so the key thing for that rejection, the thing that is critical for removing that out of focus light is the pinhole. So let's delve into this a little bit and discuss if that pinhole is so important to reject out of focus light, how do we determine what the pinhole size should be? The basic um, framework um, to think about this is if you close the pinhole, you will have less light, a thinner optical slice, and more resolution. If you open the pinhole, you will have less resolution, you will gather more light, and your slice thickness will be larger. So what do I mean by slice thickness? You can think of it this way. A confocal slices the sample through this optical trickery of the pinhole without any physical knife. So it's as if you have cut the sample virtually. The slice thickness refers to how thick or thin you're cutting that virtual slice. So a thicker slice looks more like wide field, um, so sort of more blurry but brighter. A thinner slice, um, you can see things sort of more crisply in focus because out of focus fluorophores do not contribute as much to the light. So this would suggest that, oh, you should just close the pinhole as much as possible. You get the thinnest possible optical sections. Well, it's, uh, it's a little bit more complicated than that. Um, the basic idea that the more you close the pinhole, uh, 
the better you reject out of focus light. That's completely true. So here you see um, different images uh, of a cell acquired with different pinhole settings. So the pinhole settings are measured in something called airy units. And so bigger numbers mean uh, a bigger diameter of pinhole. And you can see that if you compare the one that has a 5 area unit diameter, the image is much blurrier, blurrier than the one that has a 0.5 area unit diameter. But that's not the only thing to consider here. So um, this is another example where they cycled through 1, 1.25, 2.5, and 5 area units. Um, and they also have other data that's not shown here, but that is graphed in, in, in this uh, graph here, where they plotted two things. So they plotted slice thickness in blue, so that's kind of a measure of resolution. So there, a smaller number is better. And laser power, um, a sort of relative laser power in red. And what they did was they acquired images uh, with different pinhole sizes, and they adjusted the laser power such that the contrast of the images was very similar, so that the image visually looked very similar, uh, which is the case for the, for the four images shown there. And what you see when you do that is um, as you reduce uh, the pinhole diameter to get enough light to get an image of good contrast, at a certain point, the amount of laser power that you need to use skyrockets. Uh, and this obviously has huge detrimental consequences because it can bleach your sample or photo damage it if you're doing things live. And so typically, if you're setting a pinhole size, using one airy unit is usually a good compromise. And that's a sort of a generally accepted diameter at which to set um, a pinhole size. And it's what we recommend in the microscopy services lab. So another characteristic of confocals is that can image uh, multiple fluorophores very easily. So this is a, a sort of a, a kind of a busy diagram of a confocal, a very actually simple confocal. Uh, but I just want to bring uh, your attention to a few things in this diagram. This is really the, the very basic stuff where you can see the excitation laser, uh, which is that blue arrow coming in from the left, hitting the dichroic, going to the scanning mirrors, going to the objective. Uh, and then the, um, you can see, so that's the sort of the excitation light is that blue line going up to the objective in the sample. And the yellow line represents uh, the returning fluorescence. So the, the, the blue laser light excites fluorophores, which emit yellow light. And that yellow light comes back, makes it through the dichroic, and then goes to uh, through the pinhole into an arrangement of three photomultiplier tubes. So the photomultiplier tubes, or PMTs, are the detectors. Again, they're spot detectors. They're not cameras. They don't have any spatial information. All they do is sense light. Uh, and with a clever arrangement of dichroics and filters, you can uh, look at different parts of the emission spectrum. Now, that's a kind of a very crude confocal. Modern confocals have flexible wavelength detection windows. And so I'm going to show you a little video um, from Zeiss um, that, that kind of shows how that works in their case. Uh, the cutout here, so this this what I'm showing you in this slide before we get to the video, uh, is the example of the Zeiss LSM 710 light path. There's sort of two of these in cores on campus. That's why I put this here. Uh, and so let me see if I can get, um, yeah, here's an, uh, a pointer. So um, what you see is these are the lasers. They excite the sample. Then the light comes back. Uh, and it eventually reaches here. And what this is is something called a diffraction grating, where uh, light that hits this object, uh, part of it is reflected uh, kind of in a rainbow pattern. So wavelengths become spatial locations. And once you have that, once you have wavelengths that are at different spatial locations, then uh, what they do in the Zeiss system is they have the detectors arranged spatially so that you end up sending uh, longer wavelengths to one detector, which is this cylinder uh, uh, shown as 12 here, shorter wavelengths to another detector. This is the cylinder shown here, and then the rest to another. So let me show you that video, which I think will illustrate these things. Um, let's see here. And I'll narrate as this um, takes place. OK, so this is what this particular sort of more modern confocal looks like. This is the inside. That's the laser. Uh, hits some um, dichroics, basically, and goes 
to the sample through the objective. Then the fluorescence comes back, goes through the dichlorics. That's the pinhole that it went through just now. Then it goes to that spectral imaging with recycling loop. And so that's the part that I was discussing where the light that comes back gets uh, bounces off this diffraction grating and different wavelengths uh, are mapped uh, or sent rather to different positions. And then uh, once you have that, then it's just a matter of sending the light that is in a different location to different detectors. So you can see the long wavelength red light gets sent to this thing, which is one of the detectors. And the blue um, sort of shorter wavelength light gets sent to this. And then the other uh, wavelengths get sent to um, this uh, detector here at the back. And so by moving uh, these windows physically, you can send different wavelengths to different detectors. And instead of being having fixed filters, you can have a much more flexible arrangement that allows you to use uh, novel fluorophores that might have different curves from the standard ones. All right, so let me go back here. Uh, different companies do this in different ways, this sort of spectral um, flexibility in the detection. So as I said, the Zeiss LSM710 and Zeiss generally, they use diffraction gratings. Uh, the Olympus uh, model is to use something called the volume phase hologram. Uh, Leica uses a prism. That's uh, easy to understand. Uh, Nikon has uh, many different options. So they, they use different combinations of the, of the technologies that the other companies use. Okay, so there's just basically different ways of accomplishing the same thing, having flexible filters that you can adjust to select light of specific wavelengths. Um, one very nice feature of laser scanning confocals is that it can do bright field at the same time. So this is what's called the scan head for the Leica SP8. And so this is a very busy diagram. But down here, uh, you can see this is the objective and that's the sample. And so I want to highlight uh, sort of this detector right here. So this thing that looks kind of like a light bulb. Um, this detector gets light that gets transmitted through the, the sample uh, and can generate a bright field image with that light simultaneous to fluorescence. So that's a very nice feature of uh, a lot of laser scanning confocals. So uh, one other very uh, important feature of confocal imaging is that it allows 3D imaging. So what do I mean by this? How do you do that? So the recipe is you scan the laser in 2D, you move the sample in Z, and you repeat. So you do this in one plane, you move the sample uh, relative to the objective, and you do it again and again. And the nice thing is because confocal is an optical sectioning technique, each plane is independent, and this will eventually allow you to do a three-dimensional reconstruction. So here's an example of this. These are uh, serial optical sections acquired with a confocal of a pollen grain, okay? And so you see things that look very, very different in different planes, uh, but when you reconstruct them in 3D, you get the full structure of the pollen grain in all its 3D glory. Um, so those are really nice features of the confocal, but uh, laser scanning confocal microscopy has a number of limitations. So what are the problems with laser scanning confocal? So the first problem is that by rejecting a lot of the out of focus light, um, before it reaches the detector, and by using detectors that are inherently not as sensitive as cameras, the technique as a whole is just not very sensitive. Um, the second problem is because the laser uh, has to be scanned through the sample, um, it is a much slower technique because you have to visit every location that you're interested in as opposed to illuminating and detecting all the light in parallel. Finally, because we use lasers, these are high-powered sources of illumination. Confocal can be a very damaging technique. So how do we deal with the problem of uh, lack of sensitivity? How do we increase the sensitivity of a laser scanning confocal? So uh, as I said, there's a number of problems. Problem number one is that standard photomultiplier tubes are noisy and really not very sensitive compared to at least other things. So what can we do about this? Um, so first, let's discuss how a photomultiplier tube works. And so um, that H nu represents photons hitting some sort of sensitive piece of metal that emits electrons. These electrons then hit surfaces that are charged. Uh, and in each sort of hit of those surfaces, they get multiplied. More electrons uh, come out and are accelerated to the next surface and so on and so forth. And so basically, uh, the signal gets amplified as it moves through um, the tube. Uh, that amplification uh, is uh, sort of the source of uh, the noisiness of these of these tubes, um, and so they're not these 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 photomultiplier tubes are really not very sensitive. So so the following graph is a graph of quantum efficiency. Um, quantum efficiency means 
if a photon reaches the detector, what's the likelihood that it will get detected uh, as such? Uh, and so you can see that the quantum efficiency for low wavelengths is around 65, 70%, and then it just goes down precipitously, precipitously as you increase um, the wavelength of light involved. And so this is just not that great uh, and causes um, that problem, uh, is one of the causes uh, of that problem of lack of sensitivity. So one solution to this is to just get better detectors. And so that costs a lot of money. Um, one is to use detectors, uh, photomultiplier tubes uh, made of uh, gallium, arsenide, and phosphorus. Uh, that's a solution adopted by many companies. And here you see in red um, the quantum efficiency of those detectors. And so you can see it's dramatically better, particularly in the sort of 500 to 600 uh, wavelength range. Uh, and it's only really worse than the normal uh, photomultiplier tubes way out in the um, infrared region of the spectrum. Uh, another um, kind of detector uh, is used by Leica, uh, which is these sort of high D detectors, which are a hybrid of a photomultiplier tube and something called an avalanche photodiode. So I'm not going to go into how that works, uh, but this example just shows uh, the signal to noise ratio of detectors on three different confocals and the red ones are these high D detectors and you can see that they significantly outperform uh, their normal uh, PMT um, uh, you know, option. Okay, so another problem uh, with uh, sort of another cause of the low sensitivity on a laser scanning confocal is that the pinhole blocks light. And so what can we do about that? Um, so one way of, 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 of looking at that is uh, if, if you look at the image of, for example, a bead, a um, 100 nanometer bead, and you look at this with a, with a laser scanning confocal, this is, these are images taken with a Zeiss 880, you can see on the left, that's an image if you, if you basically open up the pinhole pretty much all the way, and you can see the bead and you can see these rings, uh, which are called airy rings, uh, which, which came from that bead. Whereas if you close it down to one area unit, now you get a very crisp image of that bead, but you're, you're really throwing away a lot of light. And that light actually has information. And so a solution to this issue of the pinhole blocking light is to just completely rethink this whole pinhole and point detection business. Again, that's a very expensive uh, solution. And it's been patented by Zeiss and their Airy scan system. And so what they have is instead of a pinhole, they take all the light that would usually hit the pinhole and they project it onto an array of detectors, which is seen here. Uh, and then they use the information from all of these detectors to make a model of what um, of what this looks like, which is uh, kind of the image of a point object. And then they, they do um, they, they apply an algorithm that sort of rearranges where all that light came from and gives you um, a significantly better image with way less photons because you're using the information from photons that would have usually hit the pinhole uh, and you're incorporating them into your image. Uh, as I said, this is very expensive and Zeiss has patented it, so only Zeiss confocals, at least for now, um, have this type of technology. So an, another main limitation with laser scanning confocal is that it's slow. Um, so anyone who has, sit, uh, who has sat in, in a room with a laser scanning confocal knows that uh, images uh, appear kind of in a waterfall pattern and there's a buzzing noise uh, that occurs uh, while uh, the image is appearing on the screen. The buzzing noise is the... Uh, is the, due to the vibration of the mirrors and, and the fact that the image takes a while to appear is because literally the laser is scanning through the sample. So uh, it's slow. An image can take um, on the order of a second or, or even more uh, to acquire with sort of decent uh, signal to noise in, in many typical cases. Uh, so what can we do about that problem? Um, so the reason this is, I mean, at the root, the, the root of this problem is that the scanners are slow. So a single image can take, as I said, an order on the order of seconds. Um, and so what, what kind of solutions do we have to this problem? So, so one is uh, kind of what we already spoke about. So if you increase the sensitivity of a system, this will allow you higher speed with the same signal to noise. Because if you are now making more of the, few, of the photons that you get, um, you can just go faster. Uh, and pre preserve the signal to noise. So instead of using the same amount of time to get a better image, you can use less time to get the same image as before, uh, which may have been good enough. Uh, another option is you scan less. Um, so you trade field of view for speed. So you can crop. Um, so you take only an image of a part of your sample or a more sort of dramatic way of, of training field of view for speed is you just do a line scan. So you just scan in a line, use only one of the, the little scanning mirrors um, 
and and then you're left at and, and you scan over time and, and and you're left with a chymograph and so people who do things like calcium imaging um sort of like this uh, this kind of approach because you can go very fast but you basically lose almost all spatial information uh, because you're just scanning in a line another option is to sand coarsely so you trade resolution for speed so what you do here is uh, you make uh, your image have fewer pixels and they are bigger pixels so it's a chunkier looking image but you can go faster and the reason you can go faster is uh, the amount of time it, it it needs to spend on each pixel might be the same but now you have far fewer pixels and so you can get through a, uh, an area much much quicker but you pay a price um, finally the, there's a technological solution to this which are resonance scanners so this is a very expensive solution so these are scanners that oscillate at a fixed frequency around 30 frames per second or higher uh, but they have less flexibility so uh, you can't rotate uh, and zoom in as easily um, as you can with sort of a normal confocal uh, and they also have sort of issues of uneven illumination you end up not having the laser on at the the same amount of time the same in in all places in the sample um, so it's certainly a solution, but it, it comes with its own trade-offs. Um, the, the other thing to, to, to keep in mind is that if you go very fast, this will cost you photons because you're not uh, pointing the laser at each location for as long. Therefore, you are not recovering for less than photons from every location for as long. You get fewer from each location. And so um, you're sort of stuck because if you go really fast, you can go fast, but then you don't get enough photons to do anything useful with that speed. Um, all right, so let's discuss another problem with laser scanning confocals, which is that um, the laser itself can be very damaging. Um, so how do we decrease the damage of a laser scanning confocal? So let's let's first discuss the problem. The problem is that light damages cells and damages fluorophores. And so this is um, uh, kind of a a, a two-panel image, uh, a six-panel image, where the, the top and bottom row illustrate different things. So the top row uh, shows fluorophores in a cell, and the bottom row shows a bright field image of those cells. And so you can see that the more that these cells were exposed to light, the fluorophores uh, were destroyed. That's called bleaching. And uh, the more that these cells were exposed to light, the cells were destroyed, which can be evidenced by that arrow there showing sort of blebbing on the surface of the cell. Uh, and which we typically call this photo damage. Uh, and so light damages cells and fluorophores. There's no getting around this. Uh, and the fact that the, the confocal needs to use a, a laser focused on a really small spot, um, so it's, it's very concentrated light, that is not good. So what can we do to this? Um, so again, so solving one problem often solves more than one problem. So if we increase the sensitivity, we can um, get an image with the same signal to noise as before, but with less damage. Um, we can get more out of the photons that we do recover from the sample. Uh, we can also scan more coarsely. We trade resolution for less damage. So um, if we have fewer pixels, we're not on each pixel as long. Um, excuse me, we're, we're not on the sample as long. Um, and so we don't illuminate it as much, so we have less damage. We can also scan faster. Um, so if we're not on each pixel as long, we can um, we can sort of damage it less, but we, we, we will trade off sensitivity. We won't get as much light from each location. Um, so we'll get an image that will be sort of noisier. A another option um, that's uh, maybe not intuitive is that um, using longer wavelengths um, decreases damage. So longer wavelengths are much less damaging to the sample than shorter wavelengths. Uh, this is the reason uh, that uh, when we train folks, we always tell them to acquire their uh, their different channels, if they have multiple channels, from longer to shorter wavelengths. The idea being um, you don't want to bleach uh, your, your fluorophores by starting with the most damaging wavelengths, which are usually um, which are which are the shorter ones. Finally, uh, something that, that that's simple to say, but often not as simple to implement, is you know improving the sample will make your life easier in so many ways. So, um, in live samples, if we use brighter and more stable fluorophores, that will just make um, it will allow us to to get so much more um, from every every sort of scan location in the sample. And if we're using fixed samples, um, using mounting media can 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 dramatically um, lower the photo bleaching rates uh, of fluorophores and so it's highly recommended. So as you can see after this discussion of all the, the problems inherent in confocals, 
uh, we're sort of stuck in what, what I would call a pyramid of frustration. Uh, so we, we can optimize for spatial resolution, for contrast, for temporal resolution, and for specimen health. But when we, we, we increase um, one of these parameters, we drift away um, from some of the others. So we can, we can get spatial resolution and contrast, but that comes at the, the cost of temporal resolution and specimen health. Um, and basically, in, in any combination, it, you're left with uncomfortable trade-offs. So you're trying to navigate the space um, and, and just trying to optimize for what's most important to you. So if you're doing live cell imaging, that's going to be specimen health so that you're studying whatever you want to study and not the death of the cells because you're imaging with the confocal. Uh, it may be temporal resolution if you're studying something very fast, uh, or it may be spatial resolution on fixed cells where you don't care as much about specimen health because they're fixed, you're in the mounting media, uh, but you pay a price, for example, in time. So what are the parameters we actually adjust on a laser scanning confocal when we're trying to navigate that, again, pyramid of frustration? So for contrast, there are four parameters that we typically adjust. Those are laser power, photomultiplier tube gain, scan speed, and averaging. And for resolution, we adjust for other parameters, which are zoom, image size, frame size, and pixel size. So let's start with contrast first. So how do you optimize contrast on a laser scanning confocal? Uh, the first thing I usually do is I try to balance laser power and photomultiplier tube gain um, to get an image of high enough contrast uh, with low enough bleaching. And so the way I do it is as follows. Uh, there's sort of two extreme cases of things I can do. One is if I have the laser power very high and the photomultiplier tube gain quite low, I'll get an image that has high contrast, but it also has high bleaching. On the contrary, if I make the photomultiplier tube gain really high and the laser power really low, so on this end, I'll get an image with low contrast and low bleaching. And I can trade off one for the other depending on how much contrast I need and how much bleaching I'm willing to tolerate. So what does this look like in practice? So, so this is an example where I balance gain and laser power. Uh, and balance, why do I say balance? Because I adjusted them so that the brightness of the image that I got was always about the same. Uh, but you'll see that for different settings, the contrast of the image was different. So this is an example where the gain was quite high at 700, um, and the laser was quite low at 0.45%. As I go through these images, you can see the effect of lowering the gain and increasing the laser power. Uh, and I think you'll agree with me that by the time you get to a gain of 450 and a laser of 55%, the contrast of the image is much higher than when we started. Um, but because we have the laser so high, that will come at the cost of higher bleaching. OK, so what other parameters can we adjust? So the two other parameters that we can adjust to optimize contrast on a laser scanning confocal are the scan speed and the averaging. So scan speed uh, is exactly what it sounds like. Uh, we can make the laser move through the sample more quickly. Averaging means we take multiple images of the sample and then we combine them by averaging them together. So if our scan speed is very high, the contrast of the imaging uh, of the image will be quite low, but it'll go very fast. If the scan speed is much slower, will have a higher contrast image, but it will take longer. Similarly, for averaging, if we don't average at all, we will have lower contrast, but it will go faster. Whereas if we average, we'll have a higher contrast image, uh, but it'll take longer to acquire. So here is an example for averaging. This is uh, no averaging, and then this is an average of two frames, four, eight, and 16. And so in this example, you can see, let me go back, no averaging, two, four, eight, 16. <clears throat> you can see a number of things. Uh, so first, the more we average, the better it looks. But you can see that the increase uh, is, um, is not really directly um, proportional to the amount of averaging. So the more we average, the more the image improves, but by a smaller and smaller amount. And the improvements uh, are more noticeable where the image is noisier. Um, so that's something uh, to keep in mind. There are sort of diminishing returns to averaging more and more. Yes, the image will improve, but it might not improve very noticeably, and so it's really not worth doing. Um, and the same is actually true uh, of all of these things. Um, you know, beyond a certain point, increasing the laser power and reducing the PMT gain, uh, 
uh, you'll get a better image, but the cost in bleaching will not be worth the increase in contrast, and the same goes for lowering the scan speed. Okay, so so I've I've been saying you know that under certain conditions you get higher bleaching, uh, but how how do these different options rank in bleaching? So the options would be balancing laser power and photomultiplier tube gain. Um, that, that's that's one option for for increasing uh, for optimizing the contrast. Another is fiddling with the scan speed. Another is doing averaging. So how do they compare as far as bleaching? So the worst for bleaching is having a very strong laser. Uh, on the sample. Uh, that is the absolute worst. So it's the fastest thing because it doesn't cost you any time, uh, but it's the most damaging option. Uh, on, the, on, the, on the extreme other end, uh, averaging is the gentlest of the options. So if you average, uh, you will bleach more than if you don't. But for the same increase in signal to noise, you will have less of an increase in bleaching than if you balanced out the laser power and the photomultiplier tube gain. And fiddling with the scan speed uh, typically falls in the middle, which makes it tip, you know, usually a very bad investment. And the reason is, for the same investment in time as averaging, you get a very similar increase in contrast. So if you average more or if you scan more slowly, the image will look better. But for the same increase in contrast, uh, reducing the scan speed costs you more in bleaching. Uh, meaning it's more damaging for the sample to have a laser going around it slowly than to have the same laser whizzing by quickly just a bunch of times. Okay, so that's something to keep in mind and why uh, I usually recommend to people to balance laser power and photomultiplier tube gain to get as much uh, contrast there as they can get away with without bleaching uh, because that's the fastest thing. But then if that's not enough, to use averaging and not scan speed because averaging for the same improved uh, contrast costs you less in bleaching. Okay, so one thing that's very, very important is when you're adjusting parameters on a confocal, you want to beware of signal saturation. Uh, saturation will irreversibly destroy your data. So, so what do we mean by saturation? So what we mean is um, if you acquire images where the pixel values um, are so high that they are at the detection limit of the detector, at the upper detection limit, uh, the detector will not know whether um, the signal from that location was at its actually at its upper limit or twice that value or three times that value. So you have sort of a ceiling effect where you can't measure properly uh, what was going on in that location. And so even if you don't care about measuring anything, this will severely distort the morphology. So on the left, you see uh, basically actin filaments uh, acquired with settings that are appropriate. And on the right, you see them acquired with settings that led to a lot of saturation. And saturated pixels, so pixels that have the maximum possible value that the detector can give, are shown in red. And so you can see that where there are actually filaments, for example, down here, uh, in the saturated image, they're just blobs. And I could make the saturated image show the saturated pixels in white, and it would be the same story. Uh, I've just highlighted them red, but you basically see blobs where in reality, there aren't blobs, there are little filaments. It's just that um, the saturation uh, is distorting the morphology. So even if you don't care about actually measuring things, uh, you should never um, set up your settings in a way that you know you will saturate uh, any of your images. Um, and the criterion for what you can leave to get saturated is usually, uh, I always tell people like, okay, if it's a piece of you know garbage that even your worst enemy reviewing your paper would agree is garbage, uh, then sure, you can leave that saturated and, and, and take the nice cell look, you know, next to it. Uh, but be very careful because uh, the saturation process is irreversible. There's no way of recovering what was going on here without uh, retaking an image with different settings. Okay, uh, so that's one of the problems with saturation. The other, um, yeah, so here, this is just an inset to compare the details. Uh, the, the other problem is that this makes quantification impossible. So if you actually do need to quantify, the fact that your data has a ceiling effect uh, renders any analysis uh, highly suspect. So if I draw, for example, a line across um, these two images, um, you can see the one that was okay, the one on the left, that's that this is showing the intensity as a function of distance along that line. Uh, the one on the left is that one that says okay, it's blue. So you can see nicely you know, what the peaks look like, whereas the one that was saturated, you can see, for example, here, how it just sort of topped out at 255 units. And this plateau is not really a plateau. It's just that the, this got chopped off and flattened into that um, kind of mesa. All right. 
Okay, so how do we avoid saturation? If this is so bad, what, what do we do to not get this problem? Um, so uh, what we do is we find a bright object in the brightest experimental condition. So, so we look in, so you will typically, uh, no, not always, um, kind of have a sense of, of what condition will have um, the, bright, the, the, the brightest object. So maybe you're overexpressing something and that you know uh, that um, in that condition, you know, you're overexpressing a protein of interest. And so you know that in the overexpressing group, that's where you'll have the brightest things. Um, and so you, what you should do is you should use that experimental condition and then find kind of the brightest object in the brightest experimental condition that you would be interested in. So, um, you know, if you're not going to look at cells that are 100x overexpressing a protein, you're just going to look at 10x, well, then, you know, find one that's at 10, 12, 13, kind of at the upper limit of what you would be interested in, uh, and then adjust your settings there. The idea being if you adjust them there so that on that really bright thing they're not saturated, then everything else, which will be kind of on average sort of dimmer than that, uh, will not be saturated either. Um, so once you find that bright object, you adjust um, your parameters so that your maximum pixel intensities are sort of at half the full range. And so um, in the Zeiss confocal software, you can very easily highlight an object. So this is a, a nuclei stained with DAPI. You can highlight that object and you can look at a histogram of the pixel intensities in that particular object and you can see uh, that these pixel intensities you know, follow a distribution. What you want is to adjust your, your parameters. So what we discussed before, the laser power, the photomultiplier tube uh, gain, um, so that the right edge of the system is kind of in the middle of the full range. Uh, and so why the middle? Why not up to here? So the reason is because if you adjust things so that your brightest pixel is very close to um, the, the, the top limit, uh, the, the confocals are quite noisy. Uh, so you could get uh, the occasional saturated pixel, but the, the, the actual, the, the, the main reason is that if you have something uh, that's that bright, um, uh, the problem is that uh, you might think that that's the brightest object in your brightest experimental condition, but perhaps it's not. Perhaps you find something that's 50% brighter later and that it falls within the realm of what you want to study. And so that for sure will be saturated. So the idea for uh, adjusting your maximal pixel intensity is at kind of half the full range is that you'll have a safety margin, so a buffer that you can use in case you run into something brighter. Because if you don't, you'll have saturated images, and then you're left with a tough decision of whether to re-image everything or to toss out that saturated image, uh, which will kind of reduce the universe of applicability of your results. OK, so that's contrast. Um, that's what so we've discussed, how to adjust contrast, how to avoid saturation. Uh, the next issue is how to optimize resolution on a laser scanning confocal, which is not the same as contrast. Um, and so this really comes down to what level of biological detail do you need? Um, and so beware, because more is not always the right answer. The key concept is what level of biological detail do you need, not what level do you want? Um, you know, we all want uh, pictures that, that look amazing, but sometimes you just don't need that. So let me kind of show you an example of why more is not always the right answer. Uh, so you may not need high resolution. So for example, if you're just counting nuclei, uh, the image on the right undoubtedly looks nicer than the image on the left. But if you have an, uh, sort of an automated algorithm that just segments nuclei and finds them in images, the one on the left might be good enough. And so what the one on the left gives you is more time to count more nuclei. And that might be a much better investment of your time than getting these sort of really nice detailed images where really um, you don't need that for, for the kind of analysis that you're doing. On the other hand, if you're in a situation where you're studying something like mitochondria, clearly the image on the left is, 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 is sort of a hot mess. Uh, you know, the, it's, 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 the pixels are so big that we can't really see anything. Uh, so we really need something more like the image on the right or, 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 or even better than that if possible. So if your answer to this question of what level of biological detail do you need, uh, if the answer to that is as much as possible, so then what do you do? And so the answer is typically as much as possible if you're looking at subcellular structures. So, you know, organelles, uh, you know, it's like you're interested in, in what, what's happening to mitochondria when you give your cells a drug, um, what's happening to the endoplasmic reticulum. And so those are examples of cases where the answer is what biological detail do I need as much as possible. Um, so what do you do in that scenario? So, so there's a few sort of key concepts that you have to understand um, to understand resolution and, and, and how you address this issue of how, you know, how, what, what do I do in that case? Um, so the first key concept is that uh, point objects are blurred. Uh, 
So if you look at, a, at something that's a point object, and a good approximation of a point object is a single fluorescent molecule. That's something very small. It might have a diameter, if it's GFP, of something like two nanometers. Uh, if you look at that with 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 you know a perfect laser scanning confocal microscope, um, you don't get an image that has a two nanometer dot. Instead, it's blurred, okay? And it's blurred such that the um, it, it's blurred in, in X, Y, and Z. Uh, in X, Y, it's blurred out to about 200 nanometers, and in Z, it's blurred out to about 500 nanometers in a sort of football-like shape. Um, and so that's a problem. Um, and so that leads to the key concept number two, which is the way we define resolution is as the minimal distance we need to distinguish two point objects. And so in X, Y, you can see these are examples of what are called airy disks, which are just basically those blurry images of point objects. Uh, and the idea is if you have a bunch of them close together, uh, because they're blurry, those blurs kind of merge together into one bigger blob, and you really can't tell if you have uh, one object or two objects very close together. And so the minimal distance where you can kind of tell that there are two objects, that's what's called uh, the resolution. And so uh, that's exemplified here for the XY um, case. In Z, you have a similar uh, issue. It's just that you know, things are blurred in Z worse than they are in XY. Uh, and so you can imagine a distance where you can tell two things apart, a distance where they're too close together, so you really can't tell if you have one or two things, and then kind of a minimal distance um, where you can just barely tell that they're apart, and that would be the resolution in Z. So, so one thing that's a little bit confusing uh, with this terminology is that when you say that a microscope has high resolution, it means these numbers, these resolutions in X, Y, and Z are small numbers. Uh, whereas if you say a microscope has low resolution, that means that these are big numbers. Um, so just keep that in mind um, as, as you're thinking about this. Um, so what do, these, what do these resolutions depend on? So they depend on the floor four wavelength uh, and the objective numerical aperture. So if the floor four wavelength is a smaller number, uh, you get higher resolution. If the objective numerical aperture is a bigger number, you get higher resolution. OK, so the, 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 the third key concept you need to understand uh, to, to, to optimize resolution in a laser scanning confocal is how you sample optimally in X, Y, and Z. Okay, so in X, Y, your sampling unit is basically the pixel size. So the pixel size is the smallest unit in your image, and so that's what you're sampling with. And so if you imagine uh, you know, a situation like this, if your pixel size has this size of this sort of red square, uh, you know, you're losing a lot of detail. Your optical system may be able to tell the difference between these two things, but everything here is gonna be turned into just one number, just one sort of blob here. Uh, so obviously that is not the right pixel size if you're trying to get the highest possible resolution from your system. On the other hand, if you have pixels that are this size, um, the blur uh, of the system is so much bigger uh, that, that it's kind of overkill. So you're wasting your time, you're bleaching unnecessarily, and you're not really getting anything. It's sort of empty magnification. So uh, kind of somewhere in the middle, there's an optimal pixel size, which is represented by sort of squares of roughly this size. And that optimal pixel size is roughly the resolution in XY uh, divided by three. And this divided by three comes from something called the Nyquist criterion, which is just uh, something that establishes for, for, for a signal that, that, that varies uh, in space, how much do you need to sample it to get an accurate representation of that signal? Um, so that's in XY. Uh, in Z, this, the, the sampling is the spacing between the optical slices that you take. Um, so if that's the resolution marked in red, if you take slices at this distance, uh, you're not gonna get as much detail as you, you know, could. On the other hand, if you take slices at this distance, uh, you're oversampling, so you're not really going to get any extra detail. You're going to waste time, and you're going to bleach the sample unnecessarily. And so somewhere in the middle, there's kind of an optimal uh, interval spacing, which, again, is the resolution in C, Z roughly divided by 3, again, uh, due to this Nyquist criterion. Okay, so clearly, um, to optimize the resolution on a laser scanning confocal, it is essential to set the pixel size correctly. So how do we do that? So ha, ha, what are the nuts and bolts that we need to do this correctly? Um, so the four parameters that we need to understand um, how to modify and how they're interrelated are zoom, image size, frame size, and pixel size. And so to set the pixel size correctly, um, 
uh, let, let's sort of break down this problem into into in, in, into parts. So you have a sample, you interact with that sample with your microscope, and you get an image. Okay. So how do those four parameters relate to the sort of sample and image? So the image size, that was one of the things that you need to uh, understand, is, is, is not the size of the image in, in megabytes. It's what space is represented in the sample by the image. So it's sort of x microns times y microns. The frame size is how many pixels does the image have in the x dimension, so n sub x, and how many pixels does the image have in the y dimension, so n sub y. The pixel size, you can see, is just the image size divided by the frame size. That's basically how much space in the sample does one pixel represent. Okay, um, And so what is the zoom? So that's the, the, the final thing that we need to understand to be able to set the pixel size correctly. So the zoom is essentially the scan area of the laser. Okay, So if the laser moves around uh, that area, that might be a low zoom um, that will determine uh, the image size and together with the frame size will determine the pixel size. Uh, in most confocals, the zoom and the frame size are directly user controlled. The image size and the pixel size uh, just result from whatever decisions you make on zoom and frame size. So, so let's uh, run through a few examples. So this is what we had started with. What happens if we take the frame size and modify it? So what if we increase it? So if we increase it, we will now have a smaller pixel size um, the image size will not change. The, the imaging will be slower because we have to send the laser to every location and there will be more bleaching because we are exposing the same area of the sample to way more laser. Okay. What if instead um, we adjust the zoom? So we can increase the zoom. So now the laser will only move through that area of the sample. So we've zoomed in. And so our image is now uh, representing a much smaller, uh, not much smaller, a smaller portion of the sample. So it's a smaller area. The image size is smaller. There will be more bleaching because uh, our power density, so how much laser we have per unit area, is higher. And the pixel size will be smaller. And in fact, it will be the same as the other example because um, I kind of made it um, that way to illustrate this. Okay. Um, all right, so uh, that, that's how all those things interact. So, so now we, we understand um, how zoom, image size, frame size, and pixel size are all interrelated. So what, what's the recommended workflow? When you're sitting in front of a confocal, what should you do? Uh, so what I recommend to people is first determine the pixel size that you need. And so this is a decision that's based on the size and spacing of the structures of interest. Uh, if you have really small things, you might need a really small pixel size. If you have really big things, uh, you might not need a very small pixel size. And keep in mind the resolution limit of the microscope. And so th there's a limit to how small a pixel can be while being informative. Okay, And you may need to go that far, but don't go beyond it because then you'll just be wasting your time and your photon budget by bleaching the sample. Uh, the second uh, thing that I would recommend is determine the image size that you need. So this decision is going to be based on the size and spacing of your experimental units. So if you uh, care about cells, your image size will have to at least be the size of one cell. If you care about clusters of cells, uh, because you care about what happens when, when they touch um, or when they're in groups, then your image size will have to be at least the size, uh, a size such that it can include those groups. If you care only about subcellular objects, maybe your image size can be smaller than a cell. Um, and so this is really based on how big the things you care about are and how spaced apart they are. Um, and there are different answers, you know, depending on whether you're looking at tissue structures, cells, organelles, etc. Um, so then once you have these two things, so this, this you can do sort of without really touching the microscope. You just have to think about the biological problem you're, you're trying to address. Then you can set the zoom to get the desired image size. Uh, and that's just a mechanical thing. You set the zoom until the image size, so the x microns by y microns is the size that you want. Once you have that, then you set the frame size to get the desired pixel size. So again, that's going to be based on what resolution you need. And then you adjust the other parameters to, to, to sort of balance contrast, bleaching, and speed. And so this is how I, I usually do things. I, I First, I set, set things up so I can sort of see the sample. Uh, but then once I have something, I figure out what pixel size I need, what image size I need, set the zoom, the frame size, and then tweak the other parameters so I get good contrast, 
low bleaching and as high speed as possible. Um, so let me switch gears a little bit. Uh, there's more to confocal than just laser scanning. So everything I've talked about so far uh, refers to laser scanning confocal microscopes, which really optimize for spatial resolution and contrast uh, at the expense of specimen health and temporal resolution. Um, but there's a different kind of confocal, and we have one of these in the microscopy services laboratory called spinning disc confocal, which operates on uh, slightly different principles uh, and is better optimized for specimen health and temporal resolution at the extent of spatial resolution and contrast. So how does a spinning disc confocal microscope work? Um, bear with me, this is a kind of a complicated diagram. Um, I hope at the end of it, you'll have some understanding of how this technology works. And I'll also show you a video which I think illustrates these concepts as well. So in a spinning disc confocal microscope, what you have is an expanded sort of beam of laser light that hits first a disc um, with a whole bunch of micro lenses. So very tiny lenses. These lenses focus an array of laser beams. So they transform this one laser here into an array of laser beams that goes through a dichroic and then hits another disc, which has a bunch of pinholes. So it's, it's an array of pinholes. And then continues through uh, the microscope, through the objective onto the sample, where it illuminates a whole bunch of little points in the specimen. Um, the light from each of the illuminated points comes back through these pinholes, rejecting out of focus light, and then hits the dichroic and is projected onto a, high sensi a highly sensitive uh, camera, OK? so. With what I've explained so far, you basically have the sample illuminated with a bunch of little dots, and you collect the light from each of those dots and project it onto uh, a camera. That by itself is not very useful. But if you now take these disks and spin them very quickly, what you have is you illuminate different dots uh, as time goes by in the sample. And if um, the, the, the these arrays of lenses and pinholes are properly set up um, on these disks, you eventually, with enough spins of these disks, so if you spin them very quickly, you cover the entire sample. So uh, if you expose the camera for long enough, what you get is an image of the entire sample where each point uh, was acquired in a confocal manner. Uh, you can think of it as kind of a, a highly parallelized form um, of, 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 scanning, of, of, of the laser scanning micro, uh, confocal microscopy that I showed you before. Um, so it's, it's much faster, it's much gentler because the laser light is spread into many small points. And because it, the light is projected back onto a camera that's more sensitive than a photomultiplier tube, um, it, it's, it's really a very sensitive form of microscopy. Now let's look at the video that will illustrate these same things. Um, <clears throat> let me go here. So here you see uh, the two disks, light going through the first disk, uh, through the pinholes and how you can get a better image. That was a little bit faster than I would have liked. Um, let's see if we can, uh, yeah, OK. So here's, here's the sort of slower version of this. There's a light going through. And what you'll see is that the, the different kind of beams scan the entire sample, and then you can get you know 3D reconstructions. So hopefully that is of some use. Um, the video is a little bit faster than I would have liked, but um, hopefully that, 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 that helps you and you can look at the video later to understand these concepts. OK. So um, just to, to do a direct comparison on a laser scanning confocal microscope, um, these are the raster patterns that you get. Um, and you can take Z stacks by just moving the sample relative to the objective, which is what we see here. On a spinning disk, it's very similar, except that the, the raster patterns that you get are these sort of um, kind of round things because they're, they're generated by little dots that are in these um, that are generated by these arrays of micro lenses and pinholes that are on discs that spin. But the end the end result is very similar. You get an optically sectioned um, uh, sort of optically sectioned images of the specimen. Um, so 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 what are some of the problems with spinning disc confocal microscopes? Um, so, so one of the problems is that um, if you have a thick sample. Uh, this whole confocality and rejection of out-of-focus light uh, breaks down. So let me show you first uh, what happens in a thin sample. So in a thin sample, uh, the fluorescence that comes from things that are in focus, which in this diagram is shown as green, um, that goes through the pinhole. Uh, 
uh, and then eventually onto the dichroic and onto the camera. So this is great. And light that comes from things that are out of focus. So this sort of lighter green uh, that comes from a place that, that that's in a different z-plane, uh, that light is aligned in a way such that it hits the edges of the pinhole uh, and never makes it, uh, for the most part, to the detector. So so that's great. Uh, you get the out of uh, rejection of the out of focus light, which is exactly what you want. And that's true for a thin sample. The problem is if you have a thick sample, um, the out of focus light uh, is, is is there's so much of it that it can bleed through uh, other pinholes and contaminate your sort of clean signal from the things that are in focus. Uh, and so what that means is that um, this type of device doesn't have as good optical section as a normal laser scanning confocal. Now there's a solution to this, which is that kind of newer models uh, of these uh, devices have uh, pinholes that are that are sort of more spaced apart. Um, but it's still the case that um, you can have some crosstalk. And so the laser scanning confocals that use single pinhole, uh, which are sort of what I discussed for most of this 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 talk, um, have better um, performance uh, at depth in sort of thick samples. All right, so confocal is great. Um, but it's not always the best technique for every application. Uh, so wide field fluorescence microscopy, which is what we started with in, in one of the first slides, is fast, it's sensitive, and it's actually great for thin samples. So things that are smaller than, than, than 10 microns, this can work very well. And so uh, these images are an example from a paper uh, done as a uh, collaboration between the Calabresi lab and, and, and I'm on this paper. And so what we were looking at there um, was, was three-dimensional uh, distances between different locations in the nucleus of a cell. And we didn't use confocal at all. It ended up being the case that, that um, using wide field fluorescence microscopy, doing Z-stacks and applying an algorithm called um, deconvolution to get sort of um, uh, better, higher contrast images uh, was uh, made this possible. Uh, it, it, the confocal was not fast enough and it actually wasn't sensitive enough to pick up these signals. So, so that was an example of a case where wide field was, was a better choice. Uh, on the contrary, uh, you know, confocals, they're slow, they're less sensitive, but they're great for thick samples. If you have anything that's, you know, thicker than 10 microns, um, these can be great. So this is an example uh, of nerve terminals in the cochlea from the Fitzpatrick lab. Uh, and so this is, this is a, a spiral preparation of the cochlea where they dissect out um, all the cells and they sort of lay them flat. And it, it's about a, several tens of microns thick. I think it's something like 100 microns thick. And... Um, if you looked at it on this wide field, you wouldn't be able to really see much uh, detail, but you look at it on a, on a confocal, and you can see very clearly the anatomy of outer hair cells, inner hair cells, and where nerve terminals are, um, uh, which is something that you just you wouldn't have the contrast to do on a wide field. Um, so one of the problems is that if you start using very thick samples, uh, they can be very hard to image. And so why are thick samples hard to image? Uh, it's because... Uh, there's light scattering uh, in tissue due to the heterogeneity and the refractive index of the components of tissue, and this degrades transparency. So if you shoot a laser beam into a piece of tissue, because the tissue has things inside that um, affect the light, uh, the light speed in different ways, uh, kind of a ballistic trajectory of the light quickly becomes something much more diffuse. And so if you can't predict where the light went or where it's coming from, uh, you really can't see anything very clearly. Um, so what can you do about this? Uh, what are your options? So your options, one option is you image thin things. Um, and so thin things, for example, are cells cultured on surfaces. Or you take the thicker things and you slice them up so that they are thinner and you image those slices of the thick things. Uh, another option is you image transparent things. So uh, there are biological samples that are naturally transparent. So for example, C. elegans is a good example. Um, another good one are embryos of zebrafish, and, and those have been selected as model organisms in part because they're transparent, so you can see into them very easily. Uh, but that's not the case for, for many things that you, know, you might be interested in. Uh, another option is you chemically clear them. So you take something that is not transparent and you run it through a series of chemical steps that homogenize the refractive index of its components, rendering it transparent. So this is obviously incompatible uh, with any live imaging, but can be a very powerful option um, if you're trying to look at things in very thick pieces of tissue. Uh, 
Uh, finally, you can use uh, infrared light by using multi-photon microscopy. Uh, and the reason this works is that infrared light um, penetrates more readily, so it's sort of more resistant to scattering or, or has a sort of, um, there's just less scattering of it. And so you can see deeper uh, with a multi-photon microscope. But they, you know, they, as always, there are trade-offs to that as well. Okay, so what other issues are there to consider when you are imaging uh, on a confocal or really on anything, but uh, since we're talking about confocal, um, we can discuss it in, 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 in this context. So what does a representative image mean? So really this question comes down to what population are we making inferences about? So in biology and usually in, in anything, you don't take a census. You don't measure every single thing that you are interested in. Instead, you take samples. You take a small subset of a population. You study that small subset. And based on uh, what you measure there, you draw conclusions or make inferences about the larger population. And so whether you can do that appropriately comes down to how you sample that population. So how do you extract that subset of elements from that larger group? to ensure that it is representative. And one, one sort of way that is established as a, as a good way of doing this, because it does lead to representative samples, is random sampling. And this is in contrast to something that uh, happens a lot during image, which is picking areas that look right. So if you look around a sample, you may have all sorts of explicit and implicit biases uh, for the kinds of cells, for example, if you're looking at cell culture, that you want to focus on. But if you do that, uh, when you do that, what you're doing is reducing the population to which you can extrapolate your conclusions. So for example, if you do not um, look at cells that seem like they are dying, then you are not um, studying the whole range of phenomena that are possible. And you may have very good reasons for doing that. But if you do not disclose them, um, you, you don't explain to the reader of your paper or, or to your colleagues that actually the population of cells that you're studying is um, the population that you, for example, infected with a virus or treated with a drug, but only actually not the full population, the subpopulation that didn't die when you did that. Um, so be very careful with the sort of picking uh, of what to image. The, the other thing that you need to think about is that showing something can happen is very different from showing how often it happens. So if you need to show something can happen, uh, one image is really pretty much enough uh, because that is proof that this weird phenomenon, uh, you know, so some chromosome rearrangement can occur, uh, some virus can get into a cell, but, but usually the, the kinds of things that you're studying, um, you, you need a higher standard than that. You, you're not just trying to show that something can happen. You want to make a statement about how often it happens. And so there it's very critical to do sampling correctly. Um, because if, if not, what you're doing is uh, you're biasing the results. So let's say you're looking for a certain phenomenon. You're interested in the frequency of that phenomenon. And you look at your samples and you look specifically for, for cases where that's happening. Um, so that if you do that, then, then if you count how often it, it happened in your images, you are biasing yourself to, to, to get a sort of a much higher frequency uh, of that phenomenon that was actually true because you've skewed your denominator. Uh, so be very careful. If you need to make a statement about how often something happens, you want to make sure you did your sampling correctly so that you get an accurate estimate of that frequency. Uh, another point to keep in mind in this discussion of representative images is thinking um, of images as evidence versus images as illustrations. Um, so this happens a lot when uh, people try to confirm something that they saw with another technique uh, with a microscope. And so what happens is they may have seen in flow cytometry, for example, that a certain kind of expression was um, uh, widespread in a, in a population, or they might have seen uh, in a Western blot that something went up. Uh, and then they, they, they try and take an image that, that, that shows the same thing. And that's fine if all you need want to do is to illustrate the phenomenon. But if you actually want to see uh, if microscopy can give you evidence, additional evidence, that uh, what you think you saw um, with another technique is what's actually going on, uh, you will need to quantify your images properly and, and to have them come from a process where they were sampled in a manner that um, is representative of the population they came from. 
um, you can't just you know hold up an image and say oh this is evidence when you know you went looking for that particular image uh, without any consideration of how often that happened and or whether it was the sort of um, most common behavior. Uh, finally, something that I encounter a lot is the a distinction between publication quality versus actual quality. And so the way this comes up um, in my work is people have done um, a whole bunch of imaging and they've done their analysis and now they want a quote publication quality image. And so to, to get those images, they want to max out all their settings and get something that's very high contrast. And, and I usually caution people against this because while you might get an image that is representative of the phenomenon that you are studying, um, it is not representative of how you um, performed your analysis, how you got most of your data, and where your results actually come from. So it's much better to show an image um, that has the actual quality that you used for your analysis so people can judge um, more accurately um, you know, the evidence behind your conclusions. You can show a sort of higher quality image, but if you do, you should you know, be very explicit in your disclosure of the fact that that image has higher quality uh, which is meant to sort of allow the reader to get a better sense of the phenomenon, but it is not the kind of image that you used for analysis. And you should show uh, an image with the exact settings you used for analysis. So another sort of set of general questions that comes up in imaging is how many images should you take? Should you take 5, 10, 20? Why? Um, is there a standard in the field? Um, is there a standard in your lab? Is there something that a postdoc told you that you should do uh, is you know 10 around number so where do these numbers come from what makes sense how do you get enough to be able to you know draw from conclusions but not waste your time and your boss's money um, a related question is is where um, where you should take uh, images so how should you you know where should you focus your sampling efforts for example um, should you image more cells in more locations in a single dish, or should you image more dishes, or should you image more cultures, or should you image more slices, or should you image more animals? Uh, and that really comes down to where is the variability? If there is a lot of variability, for example, between animals, um, then your efforts are best spent imaging um, many animals. Uh, and since something like imaging more within a single dish may be a very poor use of your time. Uh, because you don't really address the variability between animals and then you can't really draw very strong conclusions. So you've sort of wasted um, time and money uh, getting information that's not useless, but that is not as useful as it could have been if you had focused um, your efforts uh, in a different manner. So th the best answer to the question of how many images you should acquire is, in my opinion, to do something called the power analysis. So this is a formal uh, statistical technique where if you... Um, gather some parameters from a small pilot experiment, you can actually give a pretty um, good answer to this question of how many images you should take. And so what it needs, what you feed to the sort of formulas that allow you to do this is the variance of what you are measuring. So you run a small pilot and you get a sense of whatever parameter you're interested in, how much does it vary? For example, if you're measuring cell size, uh, you can measure a bunch of cells, um, you know, like 20 cells or whatever, um, just as a small pilot and get a sense of, okay, how much does, does, does the cell size vary in, in a bunch of cells that where I haven't you know, applied any treatments? Then you decide what is the minimal effect you want to uncover. So this is based a little bit on your, on your biological sense of what would be interesting. So maybe a 5% increase in cell size is not something you'd be interested in, but if cells increase by 50% in their size, that would be very interesting to you. And so you, you need to say, okay, this is the minimal effect that I would be interested in seeing. Uh, then you have to decide, uh, based on your experimental design, what statistical test you are going to use um, to determine whether that effect is present. So are you going to use a paired t-test? Um, are you going to use a two-way ANOVA, a one-way ANOVA, some non-parametric test? You have to decide what, what statistical test you're going to use um, to, to test what, whether your hypothesis is, is you reject or, or you have no evidence to reject that hypothesis. And finally, you need to decide what probability um, you're willing to accept that you will find an effect if there is one. So it might be the case that there is an effect, but you, you, know, you won't always find it. So you need to set a bound on what, what probability you consider sort of minimally acceptable of finding there the effect if there is one. Uh, 
Uh, once you have all of those things, you can put them in a power analysis and um, you get a number. And so that will give you a much better answer to the question of how many um, samples, you know, how many images should you take um, to, to try and answer your biological question. So where can you get help? Uh, so there are a lot of places to get help on UNC's campus. You have the four cores. Um, you can contact all of them um, for help. Uh, my core in particular, we have a rigor and reproducibility section, uh, which you know goes into some of the things uh, that I went to in this talk and some that I didn't, like sample preparation. I will put a link to the slides of this talk in the uh, descriptive text underneath this YouTube video. I'll also put a link in there to an excellent and recent review on confocal microscopy that I strongly urge you to, uh, I, I can't recommend it highly enough, I strongly urge you to read that. Uh, there are also online resources aside from this one. Um, uh, there are links there to a couple of really great ones. There are some good books, so that's not free. You need to buy those books. Those are my two favorite books um, for you know learning about microscopy. And there are some really great courses. Those are very expensive, so you typically need to, your lab to pay for them. Um, again, can't recommend these highly enough. Uh, I've taken actually the first one of those uh, at Woods Hole, um, Analytical and Quantitative Light Microscopy, and it's, it's sort of an intensive crash course in microscopy that starts uh, with the properties of light and goes all the way to the sort of most advanced and cutting edge techniques. Um, so those are all places where you can get good information and uh, you can always contact me um, if you have any questions. So I hope you found this useful.